Stay tuned for the Alagos Radio, the weekly radio program featuring the best in Greek music and culture, plus interviews with Greek and international newsmakers. The Alagos Radio with Michael Nevaradakis begins now. Welcome to another week of the Alagos Radio, the radio program which bridges the worldwide Greek community and which is heard on over 20 radio stations across the world and online. My name is Dr. Michael Nevradakis, and joining us once again on our program today is our regular guest, author, and ex-university lecturer, Evans Agelisopoulos, once again joining us from London. And Evans, we have a lot to talk about on today's program. Hopefully, we'll be able to get all of these topics in. But I thought that we could begin by talking about what has been happening recently in the Aegean, in the Aegean Islands, specifically such as Chios, Samos, and Lesbos, where there have been, some might say, unprecedented protests that have been taking place against not just the continuing inflow of migrants into these islands, but also against the construction of these so-called closed migrant camps. So we addressed this issue fairly extensively last time, two weeks ago, but as we keep saying on our program, a week is an eternity. Here we've had two weeks uh, a lot has happened since then. So, Evans, would you like to start by just filling in our listeners as to the nature of these protests and what we've seen go down in these past few days? Okay, great to be back from uh, snowy London, although there wasn't a lot of snow, but it's quite cold. Basically, three companies were offered about a million euros each to set up these portable camps on requisitioned land. Uh, now, we need to focus on the issue of requisitioning, primarily because in times of war, governments have requisitioned land and property for the demands either of the occupying power or the demands of the nation, which is under threat from an occupying power. Here we have a case of land being requisitioned on these three islands, and uh, if we stick onto the three islands because they're they're the ones that are mostly in the news. One is Chios, one is Lesbos, and one is Samos. Chios is a small, mostly maritime island with around 50,000 citizens, and it has a lot of people from Chios who actually have become, they are the people that drive the big commercial ships. Uh, they also produce a specific plant which is called mastika, which is from a tree, and it's the sort of Greek version of organic chewing gum. Then we have Samos, which is not as populated as Chios, but quite large. I think there's only around 30,000 citizens there, and that is famous for its sweet wine. And we have the third island, Lesbos, which is the one that became famous in 2016, because we had all the solidarity groups, all the NGOs, all the pop stars, all the celebrities uh, arriving there, you know, holding hands with all these so-called refugees. And there's about 100 to 110,000 citizens living there. And uh, Lesbos is famous for Uzo production. And it also has its own power generating facility. So this is basically the largest island and the biggest nut to crack. And the requisitioning of the land, uh, like I said a couple of weeks ago, has to occur basically with the agreement of the local population, the local mayors and the local citizens, because all the supplies to it in terms of electricity, water and the roads have to be open and clear so they can dump and create, you know, new migrant camps, which they claimed were closed. But on all the news reports, they're open. What's happened in the last three days is, basically, we had a repeat of two weeks ago, with the difference being, uh, this time round, the government sent 30, uh, they call them uh, platoons in Greek, of riot troops, uh, I think around 30 for each island. So it's probably about a 1,000 riot troops arrived on all the islands. 
heavy machinery came with army engineers and they arrived in the ports and from the ports they would make their way to the requisition land and start setting up shop. Now because they know the locals are vehemently against it, A, they don't want their land requisition, B, they don't want a doubling of the migrant population, and C, who agreed to it? There was no local referendum, there was no vote, it's just government dictat. One day they printed a government paper saying all this land has been assigned and basically taken over. So over the last three days, there's been riots, which I'll come back to. There's been chaos developing. There's been a political crisis with a new democracy, because all the local officials have resigned. And there's been a lot of movement with even shots being fired, people being injured, and the riot police being removed from where they were staying in their hotel. Right, and there was this video that it's possible even that some of our listeners have come across this video on social media or on YouTube of a swarm of locals on the island of Hios entering a four-star hotel where this platoon of uh, riot police were staying. And they literally broke into the rooms while the riot police were there off duty. And they physically attacked the riot police through their uniforms and clothes out the windows into the grounds below. Uh, and this video quickly went viral on the internet in Greece in particular. And that's why I mentioned before that uh, these protests were unprecedented. I don't think personally I can remember seeing riot police attacked so directly like that by citizens in Greece, despite the fact that they're extremely unpopular, particularly due to the role that they played during the past decade in helping successive governments enforce and pass the unpopular austerity measures and cuts and privatizations. Now, having done that, they're seen to be helping the current government help with this uh, requisitioning, as you mentioned, of the land. Our American listeners may compare these requisitions to the concept of eminent domain, which is basically a government takeover of private property, private land. But in the U.S., historically at least, this had to be done with some sort of public interest in mind and with the owners, the original owners of that land being fairly compensated. That actually has not always been the case, but that's the legal theory and legal concept behind it. What we're seeing now in these three islands in particular that we've been talking about is the government is sort of vaguely saying that owners will be compensated, but this was really just done by diktat, as you mentioned, Evans. But it was just unprecedented to see these riot police troops get attacked like this and for this to even be caught on video and to circulate so quickly throughout the internet in Greece. And there's been various reports of roadblocks that have been set up by citizens blocking off roads with boulders and rubbish bins and anything else that they could find. Uh, in some cases, even riot police uh, platoons having to retreat from their positions. So, Evans, have you do you have anything to add to that? Have you seen anything else uh, indicating how effective the riot police uh, response has been so far? Yeah, basically to focus a little bit on the riot police. I mean, historically, they were created in 1976 uh, in Greece by the now deceased President Karamanlis, and I think he modelled them on the CRS in France where he was in exile under the junta. So they're basically part of the police force, but a militarised section of it. And they go in heavy-handed, basically, with tear gas, rubber clubs, and they just beat everyone up. And there is a case in point in Chios where about eight of them were manhandling uh, one citizen and they were rubbing his face on the concrete floor. And uh, you can see the mud, I mean the blood on the floor in the video. And 
uh, there's no need for such a heavy handedness. In another video, they went round smashing up cars when they were leaving the island. And in other videos, they were attacking women. And one woman in particular had just come out of surgery. So what I think they do is, and this is probably the way social media also works, uh, once they arrive, they're probably instructed to go in heavy-handed. Then a whole bunch of videos are circulated of their heavy-handedness to create a psychological fear to make the citizens afraid. But what the governments don't understand is from the point of view of politics, from the moment there aren't really politically organized forces that A, control the citizens and also channel demands in certain political directions, basically chaos takes over. And uh, without being constrained by political parties, citizens will take the matter into their own hands. So obviously these islands are very small. Everyone knows each other's business. And everyone knows, for instance, which hotels the riot police will be resident in. So when the citizens probably broke away from the main demos and targeted the hotel, it meant that they were preparing for it because they knew that they were arriving and where they would arrive. Yeah, the, the funny thing is, is that the ships arriving on the islands were put into a blackout. So the citizens couldn't work out at what time they would arrive in the ports. Uh, so the government basically tried a full-on military reinvasion of Greek property to throw the Greeks out and hand it over to migrant blowings. But it didn't really work because these islands are, you know, they're not very large. They only have probably one or two ports uh, in general. So it, it doesn't take long to have one or two people there looking at when ships are arriving so they can then send a message out to try and greet them and there were some quite original interventions in, in one of the islands uh, the mayor got the equipment for where they take the rubbish out and he you know they blocked roads in another island uh, one of the farmers got their tractors and stormed it into one of them riot police buses the government announced 64 police injured, so it's quite tough. The question is, this type of conflict with the riot police hasn't necessarily happened with citizens to such an extent yet. When the riots happened in 2010-2011 over the IMF measures, there were two instances where the riot police lost out. One was from a section of workers who were the ones who carried the vegetables in the market in uh, Pires, they confronted the riot police over some local issue that they had, and the riot police went in heavy-handed, and apparently, you know, they hid the report. Workers at the vegetable market held hostage two or three riot police and threatened them with their lives if they didn't release their comrades who were arrested. And the second more famous incident was when the police were marching, the actual police, uh, against cutbacks in their salaries and pensions, and the riot police attacked them. And because they're in the same actual department, you know, that they're both part of the same service, it's just that the riot police are like the heavy-handed boot boys. The police didn't expect to get beaten up, primarily because they go around beating everyone up. And the police responded by holding hostage the riot police at their headquarters in Gesariani. And I think guns were pulled on both sides and calmness, someone intervened to try and create calm. But it actually showed that the actual state was starting to disintegrate. Because, uh, you know, when you have one section of the police taking guns out against another section, it's basically chaos theory. Now, what my question is, are these attacks on uh, the riot police deliberately engineered by sections of the government as well? And why do I say that is? Because uh, one of the, you know, the regional governor of the whole area, a character called Munzuris, who stood on an independent pro-new democracy platform, is always on record saying that he wants 
to lessen the burden on the islands by removing the migrants and sending them all onto the mainland. So is this whole event deliberately brought to, you know, heavy conflict in order then for the government to say we have to release them? And why do I say that is because apparently the agreement with Turkey implies that if migrants arrive on the Aegean Islands and then they leave the Aegean Islands, the agreement states that they can never be sent back to Turkey. So that is one side of the scam. The other side of the scam is that so many are arriving. I mean, during these three days of conflict, 150 arrived. So many are arriving, obviously they physically can't fit on the existing migrant camps. That is why they've come up with another agenda of doubling the size. But when you end up with these types of physical conflicts, the government can obviously utilise the anger of the people, the justified anger of the people, to go into another direction, which is basically remove them from the camps, bring them onto the mainland, and suffer another set of conflict with Greeks on the mainland, and then fill up the islands again, and we're back to square one. That's one, one thing they could do. The other thing they could do is basically send in more forces and try and beat the people down. Uh, and I think that is the more complicated one, primarily because from the videos we've seen, the islanders are on their own terrain. Uh, a lot of these areas are hilly, and riot police were basically made to be in cities where there's roads, there's buildings, and you know the whole area and people can't easily have access to objects to lob at them. So putting riot police in semi-mountainous terrain, in open fields, and, uh, you know, they were tear gassing the people, and the tear gas was coming back as well, because the wind was blowing in the wrong direction. And at one stage, the riot police retreated so much, they went and hid into an army camp, and people were lobbing uh, Molotov cocktails inside a Greek army camp, which brings me back to, you know, the conflicts in COS in 2016, when they first started all this, uh, where the riot police ended up being held hostage in the hotel they were staying in, and the citizens were lobbing uh, rockets that they used at Easter for the celebrations above the hotel. A similar situation has happened now, where citizens showed that the police used rubber bullets against them, and then videos have now surfaced of citizens having used shotguns which are being fired above the heads of the riot police in this army camp. So what we're witnessing is basically a breakdown of the state and a breakdown of law and order. And if we remember in COS, the riot police called for the army captain on the island to intervene and crush the citizens. And the army captain refused. He said the army's not here to attack citizens because obviously it brings back memories of, you know, 1967 to 74. A lot of interesting points there, Evans. And I think that uh, I'll start with this last point here in Greece, the way that this utilization of the platoons of the riot police and this mobilization of the riot police on the islands has been circulating on the social media in Greece, in many cases has been as an invasion or an attack of the Greek government against the Greek people. So that is something that is being heard on a daily basis now and for the past few days. I should mention that we're recording this program on Friday, February 28th, so all throughout the past week, this is what we have been hearing on much of the uh, social media chatter that is related to what has been happening in these Aegean islands. So what this does, on the one hand, is it really gives the government, and we're talking here now about a new government that has only been in power since July, and one that supposedly campaigned 
in part on a platform to take care of the migrant issue and to uh, stop this open borders policy that was in place for so long. We're seeing them put into a very difficult position. These islands actually voted for new democracy for the party that is in power in last July's elections. And I think that it's probably not a coincidence, first of all, that it's been quite a while since the last time I've seen a public opinion poll showing us the relative popularity of any of the parties, the Greek political parties, and what the voter intent would be if elections were to be held today. So I think that the media, who are the ones that present the, the results of these polls to the public, are withholding information, withholding polls that might show that there's just a breakdown in general of support toward the political system and not just the government, but the main political parties that I think more and more Greeks view as all having more or less the same stance on open borders and migration. Now, Evans, you also mentioned something else that was something that I also had in mind, which is to what extent are these attacks on the riot police either engineered in some way on purpose to provide the impetus to then move the migrants onto mainland Greece, or at the very least are events that the government is taking advantage of for that same reason. And I say this because some of the things that I've seen on social media these past few days are a little bit suspicious, to say the least. I saw, for instance, one article from a very supposedly far-left-leaning website relaying a message from the Antifa slash anarchist contingent in Exarchia, which our listeners may know is traditionally the so-called radical part of Athens, relaying a message in support of the attacks against the riot police. I think the message had something along the lines of, we know all about what it's like to be clubbed in the head by these people. So, these protesters from Exarchia, though, in many cases in the past when protests took place in Athens, were at the very least blamed by many other citizens as being the ones that would instigate the riot police in the first place, because a peaceful protest could have been taking place against, let's say, the IMF measures and the austerity, and all of a sudden... Some guys in hoods show up and they start throwing Molotov cocktails at the riot police and then that would give the riot police the only excuse they needed basically to start throwing tear gas, which interestingly enough would never really seem to be against these guys in the hoods and the masks, but against the masses at large. So the protests would break up and would effectively be ended. So the way that I've seen it is I think in these three islands, there's at least three different forces at play. There may be more you could add to this if you want, Evans. I think there's people that just don't want the migrants coming in at all, whether it's to the islands or to the mainland. They are in support of closing the borders and ending this inflow of migrants. There's a second school of thought that says the islands have had enough, we here in the islands have had enough, but the rest of the country, and then by extension also the rest of Europe and the EU, have to take their so-called fair share. So they're not saying that the inflow has to stop or that borders have to be closed, but that Lesvos and Chios and Samos cannot bear the full brunt of this anymore. So there, to summarize, they are in support of moving them onto the mainland. And then, of course, there's the people on these islands that are benefiting from this entire situation. You've got hotel owners, you've got various business owners that are making money off of the situation during times of the year, such as now, during the winter, when the, the economy on these islands is very slow. You did mention some of the things earlier, Evans, that these islands are known for, from Masticha and Hios to Sweet Wine and Samos, but also to a large extent, these islands rely on tourism. And for the past few years, they've had a form of tourism year-round, because you've got NGO people that are there throughout the year. They're renting homes, they're renting hotel rooms. You've got local businesses that are catering 
both to the migrants and also to the NGO people and to various other associated individuals that are employed in some way and connected in some way to the migrant issue. So they want this to continue because they're profiting off of it. So it's creating, you mentioned before that these attacks between citizens and police and sometimes between police and police Regular police and riot police are creating a breakdown of the state. And I think we're also seeing a breakdown of local society because there's different interests at play that are pulling people in different directions. Well, if we look at the picture from a, a longer political view, we notice that the Greek state is trying to replace basically the local population like everywhere. You know, they want to create, you know, what they call a multicultural society. But because the jobs don't exist, they're not there. You know, something like 80,000 businesses have shut down in the last decade or so and have relocated to, to other countries. Uh, the physical jobs aren't there. And, you know, the latest round of cost cutting is, you know, they want to shut down Largo, which is a very large uh, still smell processing plant. I think it's the last one remaining in Greece. They want to shut that down as well. So they basically worked out that they can generate money from the so-called migrant refugee. I mean, you know, Greece went from the 1960s and 70s where we had tourists who were basically backpackers and they would just camp on the beach spend as little money as possible for months on end. Then when we had the development in terms of uh, hotels, we went to the four-star and five-star hotels, which has a closed system in terms of food, so they don't basically use a lot of the local economy. And now we've gone to this new breed of uh, tourists, the one you, you explained, you know, the AGO, who supplemented with the migrant flowing and the more that come the more money they all self-generate and you know reports have surfaced in the last week that refugees that declare that they're children you know most of them are about 25 to 30 the government is going to pay around 1,500 euros a month which is basically double the starting salary of a Greek doctor and another report surfaced that around 30 billion has been spent on the hospitals for the migrants. But coming back to another angle on this issue, it may have something also to do with Turkey, primarily because Turkey is getting hammered in uh, Italy and in Libya. They, in Libya, they lost uh, their general, and the Russians have threatened them last night that they're going to be sending ships through the Bosphorus to pass them on the coast of Turkey to bomb them from the sea as well in Idlib. So the Turkish situation is obviously quite complicated because we don't know where it will be heading. And Erdogan, with Merkel, always has, you know, an ace up his sleeve where he can offload thousands onto the island. But if he does that, I personally believe he will collapse Greek government because I, I also don't believe that any amount of riot police that can arrive there are going to be able to do over the locals. So whether the attacks, the information of where the riot police are was revealed and whether the locals are being helped by government forces, we can't obviously know. All we know is from history, when the government's in a bind, they normally co-opt or adopt a section of the demands to their own end. In other words, if you remember in 2010-11, when Papandreou was in a bind and there were like riots and demonstrations everywhere, he like resigned one afternoon after allegedly agreeing to be in a coalition government with Samaras. And then he took back his resignation because Samaras didn't agree to the deal. And Samaras at the time was running on a anti-austerity platform. And then he ended up governing a bit later after the EU installed a banker as an interim prime minister. So we don't know in which direction this is going to head, but there are obviously ructions within the new democracy.
Liverpool party on a local level because I, I do not believe that any of them can show their faces to the citizens, even if, you know, they adopt, uh, you know, we support the island facade, when people know that they sent in riot police to beat people up. You're listening to The Alagos Radio. I am Dr. Michael Nevradakis, and with us today once again is our regular guest, Evans Agelisopoulos, speaking to us from London, ex-university lecturer and author. And Evans, I'm glad that you brought up the issue of Turkey uh, a moment ago, as it is connected very closely to what is happening, what has been happening for the past several years and what is happening now. You mentioned, of course, that Turkey is really getting hit hard in Syria, in Afrin, I believe, as of yesterday, February 27th, they lost, I believe, 29 troops. As you mentioned, they had losses in Libya, including one of their major generals. And up until recently, what we were being told by both the international media and also certainly by the Greek media, including these so-called patriotic sites that we talked about a bit last time, is that Turkey was just going to go into these places and it would be a cakewalk and it'll just take over portions of Syria and they will prop up the so-called internationally recognized government in Libya. And once they do that, they would come for Greece next. And then, as it turns out, it's not quite a cakewalk for Turkey, either in Libya or in Syria. But what we've been hearing since yesterday, and again, this is being recorded on Friday, February the 28th, what we've been hearing since yesterday is that Turkey, in retaliation for the losses that it has sustained in Afrin in particular, with those 29 or perhaps more deaths, is opening the floodgates and is giving any Syrians or so-called Syrians who are fleeing the country and coming into Turkey, giving them safe passage for, I believe, 72 hours to enter Europe. So to cross Turkey from one end to the other and to enter Europe, which presumably means Greece, which presumably means, again, those same three islands that we've been talking about, Chios, Lesbos, and Samos. There's also the mainland crossing in the region of Thrace that we talked about on our last broadcast. And the figures that I've seen indicate that there's anywhere between three and a half and five million supposed refugees that are in Turkey or who are crossing through Turkey at this time. So if this enormous number of people was to try to cross into Greece, which is the primary entry point from Turkey, I don't see how any number of forces would be able to then sustain what would be more than likely a backlash on the part of the citizenry uh, there's only so many riot police to go around, even in Athens, and it just seems that if up until now the citizens of these regions have had enough, if all of a sudden, instead of 150 people a day coming into these islands, you've got them coming in by the thousands, I just don't see how that would be a sustainable situation. Well, definitely, and one people are on the move, they start to develop their own ideas and their own agendas. And this is where we might need to touch upon the so-called coronavirus, because under the guise of basically open borders and free movement, uh, we now have uh, an event which, in my opinion, has been engineered out of all proportion, but it has given the government the ability to pass certain laws and acts which are basically going into dictatorial territory. Uh, the Greek government, I think, three days ago, passed one of their acts in secret, which obviously isn't voted upon by anyone. It's not even discussed in relation to coronavirus. And I'll read some of the legislation that's been told. It's obviously from Greek, so I'm going to do a rough translation. It says that the government is given powers to take measures where it can impose on people the immediate uh, health control, 
following to give them medication and to put them in hospital, uh, whether they like it or not, to basically take measures to shut down uh, airports, the sea. I don't know how you close down the sea, but what they mean is probably the ports, to close down the railway and to close down the roads and also to put under provisional isolation any areas they deem to be a threat. Also to block people from meeting other types of people. Now, everyone knows these camps are full of diseases and a lot of individuals are coming from Asia where this virus started from or allegedly started from. And the government has produced basically a whole list of measures and continuing to some other measures, they can shut down schools, they can shut down any public building for whatever reason, they can shut down theatres, cinemas, gyms, cultural events. Uh, the mayor of Patrat, who on a communist party ticket, suddenly announced the closure of the Patras festival, which brings, you know, much needed money to the town and is an annual event, so all the bookings have just thrown up. It's not happening by government dictat. And allegedly, uh, this virus leads to death. Now, the official figures are, today, uh, I think 80,000 have contracted the virus in China, and there's less than 3,000 deaths. And this is, what, a full two, two and a half months of the existence of the virus. Now, China's got about 1.4 to 5 billion people. Uh, they claim these people have died from this virus. And if I go into the history of it in relation to viruses, you know, when I was growing up, I was a teenager in the 80s, they spent every day telling us if you catch HIV, it ends up becoming AIDS. So basically, if you have that virus in your blood, automatically you will get the AIDS syndrome. And very soon thereafter, within six to nine months, you will drop dead. Many years later, I think in the mid-90s, a Nobel laureate in chemistry who specialised in virology said that there is no connection between the HIV virus and full-blown AIDS. So my question is, this coronavirus, A, who says it leads to death? B, who says it's transmittable in the manner with which they say it is? And see, we haven't been given any breakdown of the numbers of people and what age range they have, you know, have been affected by it. And this has caused uh, a death because a couple of cases I read about, they said the first person that died in, in France was over 80 of Chinese extraction and he died from this virus. Well, I mean, you know, he's already 80. He's going to die of something. And Trump yesterday or a couple of days ago said, we have how many people dying of the flu, which is a much, you know, it's a major issue. And I went on to a couple of websites to see how many people annually die of the flu, between 200 to 500,000 globally. Uh, I've never heard of restrictive measures to such an extent against the spread of flu. And the spread of flu spreads quite easily. You know, you get on a public bus or you go to the gym and touch something that someone else has touched, you then touch your nose, you're going to get a cold, which could develop into a flu. So why all of a sudden do we have this mass hysteria of the coronavirus, but zero hysteria about who arrives in Greece by the same government who want to take restrictive measures basically against the Greek population? But when it comes to the migrant flowing, no restrictions whatsoever, and they're all wonderful, and there are no diseases, and everything should continue. And, you know, going a bit further, is the coronavirus part of a globalist, you know, deep state counter-attack because they lost impeachment? Because, you know, when we look at the, the forces and the owners of media networks who are part of the globalist wing of imperialism, like the Washington Post, and the New York Times, I think the Washington Post is owned by Bezos, the New York Times by that Mexican uh, multi-billionaire, Carlos Slim. They have both, I mean, the New York Times yesterday stopped calling it a coronavirus, 
and rebranded it a Trump virus. And the Washington Post circulated articles that, you know, the American CIA dumped the virus in Wuhan in China to spread it. So what is actually going on and to what end? Well, I think you bring up a lot of interesting points and a lot of food for thought, Evans. And regardless of what the realities behind the coronavirus and its origins might be, and I think all of us, uh, including all of our listeners, have probably heard all sorts of different theories about it, from that it was engineered in a lab, to it was a biological weapon that went wrong, to it's the result of people in China eating strange things. I mean, you know, whatever theory one wants to ascribe to, it does seem that various governments around the world, and a Greek government is no exception to this, are in some way, in some sense, taking advantage of public fears and uh, media sensationalism over what has been going on, again, for their own ends. Very similar to what we were talking about earlier today about how the government might choose to take advantage of the protests against the migrants for their own ends. So you mentioned, for instance, the city of Patra. They shut down their annual major festival. It's the Carnavali, the Carnival. It's basically the Greek equivalent of Mardi Gras for our listeners. And I know we actually even have listeners in New Orleans. So one of the biggest events annually in Greece, that's been shut down. And yet on the other hand, you see, for instance, that football matches, soccer matches that are scheduled for this coming weekend will be taking place as scheduled, no restrictions whatsoever. Spectators will be allowed into the stadiums. Uh, So there's just no consistency either in how these measures are being implemented. On the other hand, there's a private high school in Athens that today, Friday the 28th, is closed, uh, supposedly because someone there had traveled recently to northern Italy. There's other educational institutions uh, in Greece where if they had students that were uh, recently in effect in areas where supposedly there has been an outbreak of the virus, such as northern Italy, they've quarantined those students and even faculty members. Anyone that's been in those areas, they're just telling them don't come in for a couple of weeks. So you're seeing this response that is kind of all over the place. There was a, a, a member of parliament or or perhaps a former member of parliament of Syriza, the party that was previously in power in Greece, that came out and said that the coronavirus is being spread by people that can afford to uh, travel by airplane. So you can see where that individual might be going with a statement like that, because if we connect it back to this issue of migration, as you mentioned, Evans, one of the main matters of contention that opponents to open borders have is the fact that people are coming in, no one knows their background, and no one knows what they're carrying with them. There's no health checks. There was a time, uh, I can think of, for instance, family members of mine decades ago who went from Greece to the United States and they uh, had to go through the legal channels to do so. And part of those legal channels was actually going to doctors prescribed by the embassy, the U.S. embassy, to be checked top to bottom before being given a medical clearance to enter the country. So that was going on in the 60s and 70s. What we're seeing now in Greece and in other parts of the world is, you know, open up the borders, no checks whatsoever. And if we even look beyond just the coronavirus, in recent years, other diseases that have been non-existent in Greece for decades have reappeared again. Even if it's just an incident here and an incident there, we're talking about diseases where there had been no incidences recorded for quite a long time, and it's not very difficult to put two and two together and to figure out how these diseases that in Europe have not existed for almost a century have suddenly reappeared again. So that is another one of the several points of contention that a lot of people have uh, regarding this open borders regime. And uh, one example that some have been pointing to is Russia. Russia shares an enormous border with China, thousands of miles in length, I believe. 
And yet, if the figures that we are being told are correct, I believe there's only been two recorded cases of the coronavirus in all of Russia. We're talking about a country that is, that's bigger than some continents. So uh, Russia, however, is maintaining a closed borders regime from what I understand, from the information that I have with China, whereas countries such as Italy and several others continued, for instance, to allow flights in from China freely. So if we believe all of this is in fact the case, then it is actually a case against open borders. And yet, ironically, as you mentioned, Evans, it's actually being uh, weaponized by certain sections of the media. You mentioned the New York Times and the Washington Post against Trump, which is mind-blowing. One doesn't have to support Trump to have to wonder what he has to do with the coronavirus and its spread. And yet, you know, as you mentioned, you have the New York Times calling it the Trump virus. And being that impeachment failed, being that he's drawing enormous numbers of people to his rallies, we even saw this in India recently, being that the Democratic Party in, in, in the United States is just a total circus at this point. They're, the infighting between them is unbelievable. It just seems like, regardless again of the origins of this virus, that it's being used as a last-ditch effort to try to hit Trump because it doesn't seem they have anything else to hit him with. They've tried to bring up Russiagate again. That doesn't seem to be working. So now they're saying that somehow the virus is his fault. Yeah, and, and plus, we're having you know, a collapse of the stock market. This, this continues. Uh, on the one hand, will obviously also show the dependency of the Western economy on China and uh, part of the rise of the Trump administration was to sort of rebalance uh, the globalist economy and try and have a nation state based economy again. And uh, maybe a lot of your listeners. Uh, don't know, but Wuhan is actually the sort of car making area or the auto production area of a lot of foreign companies that have uh, production facilities there. And we have seen over the last uh, six or eight months, uh, for instance, that German car production has collapsed to almost 20% uh, figures not seen until the mid 90s. And basically, when the Chinese New Year was over, which I think was uh, towards the first week of February, a certain report appeared, which stated uh, that China may need a, a two-month shutdown, because, as we know, during the Chinese New Year, a lot of people that don't work in the big city go back to the country areas to celebrate New Year uh, and they weren't called back to work because of, you know, the virus, allegedly. And then this basically forces a shutdown of, you know, production. And it doesn't look like they're going to be fired. And then basically they can uh, force for product which they're not going to the cell. Now, maybe because China embarked on this, then the Western globalist media, you know, created a mass hysteria over the virus. And we know how the media and the deep state work. They have uh, certain people in certain neurotic positions whom they then put pressure on to propagate whatever angle they're up to. And now you've told me that the series of MC came out with that nonsense, you know, linking climate change to coronavirus, which basically means, you know, don't travel, don't get on a plane, don't need to stop dead to save the planet. Then it looks like a section of the state is co-opting the demands of people about, you know, the spread of diseases because of uncontrolled immigration. And they twisted it into, you might be the danger, but we're going to give you a virus 
and everything that surrounds with it, and then take restrictive measures against you. So you never complain about anything. So basically, if your child is suffering from, you know, an outbreak of measles, because suddenly Afghan teenagers have turned up, that's not an issue anymore. It's the coronavirus that no one's seen or heard. And, you know, when you look at the images, you start to laugh. People get off planes and they put a thermometer on their head and they show this image over and over. And that proves what? I mean, if you've got a virus in your system, you need a blood test. A blood test takes minimum a week. So, how would they know what's wrong with you if you've just arrived in an airport? They wouldn't. And even if you had a fever, they would then have to take you to a hospital, have a blood test, and then give you some results which are going to take a week. So what happens in, in the meantime? Where are you? When the first people arrived from Wuhan into the UK, they were taken allegedly to some nurses' quarters, ex-nurses' quarters, somewhere in Liverpool. And uh, they obviously got some coach company to take them. And the passengers were in the back of the coach with them funny masks on. And they were taken to Liverpool. The driver was normal. He had no mask. And then the media started saying, well, if they got a disease which could spread, how come the driver just looks normal? And another funny incident, some hotel in Tenerife, they claim, I don't know, people have got the virus, so they have to stay in the hotel and they provide them food and drink. And then you had one woman complaining, they're not wearing their mask when they're eating. So how can you eat with a mask on? I mean, the whole thing is a joke. It's a circus. <laughs> you know, when you see stories which are so blatantly contradictory, you you instinctively feel that there's something up. I don't believe the level of what they claim, you know, the figures, 3,000 deaths in two months, it would probably take, I don't know, 40 lifetimes to wipe out the whole of China. So, we're not going to be around, and it will never happen. Right. We we are seeing all sorts of different stories circulating. Um, <laughs> I have one that's open in front of me here. Dog tests positive for coronavirus and quarantined in Hong Kong. Uh, even though the dog is not showing any symptoms, there was one I came across yesterday about a brothel in Spain, in, I believe in Valencia, where the entire brothel was quarantined and everyone will have to stay there for two weeks. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, that's, that's what I've been I mean, who, who, who knows? Who knows what's going on? But, you know, going back to China, and as we get as we uh, get close to wrapping up our show today, there's been some alternative theories that have been circulating as well. And again, you know, what we're doing here at uh, the Alibus Radio is, you know, we're just talking. Uh, there's been people over the years that have gunned for us, that have tried to <laughs> twist words that have been said on this show, and I'm not going to have it. Uh, we're just relaying, you know, what's being heard and what's being discussed out there by ordinary people in many cases. So in the case of China, uh, a couple of other alternative theories that I've heard regarding either the possible sort of, let's say, agenda behind some of the measures that are uh, that are being implemented in response to the virus – include just the, um, one theory being that China is producing just too much capital, excess capital. They don't have markets for all of these goods anymore. They need to slow down production for a while and uh, let, their, let the productive sector of their economy cool off a bit. Uh, that's one theory that I've heard. Another alternative theory that I've heard is that it's actually an attack on Chinese industry and that somehow this virus was introduced to China. Its origins are actually not from China. And it was introduced to China and specifically to this industrial region of China, Wuhan, to cause basically destruction to, again, the productive capacity of the Chinese economy. So again, these are theories. We have no way of proving them, but they are circulating. And it does show that people are at the very least, suspicious of at least some of the things that are being told by the media about the virus and everything related to it. So as we're coming 
coming up right at the end of the program, Evans. Uh, I, I will mention one final thing. You brought up the flu. Uh, just in Greece alone this winter, uh, I believe as of yesterday, the 27th of February, 77 deaths from the uh, various strains of the flu virus. In the meantime, uh, there's just been, as of yesterday, three confirmed cases of coronavirus and no deaths. So just to put things in uh, perspective. So as we wrap up, Evans, is there anything that you would like to add? Well, basically, which way is the Greek government going to go? Are they going to try and use this virus uh, as a way of closing down the borders? I doubt it. Uh, but they could quite easily use the virus to do so. And in the bigger picture, uh, the virus makes uh, China appear to be of necessity to us. In, in other words, if China stops exporting, you know, the whole world is going to drop dead. And that is where the coordinated attack by the global infraction uh, within the U.S. state uh, wants to use this virus to their advantage. Because remember, Bezos, 90% of his products come from China. And if he fast tracks a collapse in trade, uh, then that undermines basically Trump leading up to the election. And it makes people complain, you know, well, why is this happening? Where, from my point of view, you know, the Trump administration could go on the counter attack and say products that we can't receive, we're going to make there, or we're going to source them from somewhere else. Well, whatever the case may be, Evans, as we've been saying in uh, our recent broadcasts, a week in politics is an eternity. We're going to be back in two weeks, and it will be interesting to see by that point what developments have transpired in the Aegean Islands with the issue of migration, how things will be going with Turkey and its so far not very successful campaigns in Syria and in Libya, and then, of course, what will be going on with the coronavirus in a couple of weeks. So, Evans, once again, thanks for taking the time to speak with us today. Okay, thanks for your listening. And this has been the Galagos Radio. I am Dr. Michael Nevradakis. We will be back again two weeks from today with our next English language edition. Remember that you can find our programs and podcasts on thealogosmedia.org, D-I-A-L-O-G-O-S media.org. Thanks for joining us. Follow the Alagos Radio on Facebook and Twitter and remain connected to all our latest news and updates. Check us out today at Facebook.com slash Media and at Twitter.com slash Media. Find the Alagos Radio's programming in iTunes and Apple Podcasts. You can now download our podcasts and listen to the Alagos Radio 24-7 anytime, anywhere in iTunes, iPhones, iPads, and on Apple TV. Check us out today in Apple Podcasts and in iTunes Internet Radio. The Alagos Radio 24-7. Our online radio station, which features the best mix of Greek Greek music, plus programming and interviews from the vast The Alagos Radio archive. Tune in through our website, thealagosmedia.org, in iTunes Radio, or at tunein.com.